So particle tracking, um, this is just an introduction, a very basic introduction. Um, okay, not going as fast. Um, so an outline of this one, it's a very brief background. And then I'm gonna talk to you about the Eulerian and the Lagrangian frameworks and then how these two frameworks are actually methods to observe the ocean and also to model it. Then I'm going to talk to you about the particle tracking analysis and how is it useful and some of the applications and the physical process that affects Lagrangian transport in the ocean. So the marine environment is highly variable in space and time, as you all know. And here are just some animation of the global NEMO model. Um, I hope you can see them running. For me, they stop already. <laughs> so the ocean currents redistribute everything in the ocean. So heat, nutrients, pollution, even living organisms all around the world. And they connect geographically separated areas. Therefore, it's very important to understand the spatial interconnectedness or connectivity um, of local coastal regions. Uh, and it can be very helpful for management and protection. I really don't know if you got to see the animations at all. So that is just surface currents um, in the global model. And then we can see that everything in the ocean is moved about by this current. So we can see in this other animation, um, total primary production. So that will be chlorophyll. So it moves about everywhere as well as if you sit in a point, you see it changing over time. Um, and modeling models are so cool because you can model everything. You can model the past, you can model extreme events, and you can even model the future. As you can see, uh, this total primary production, we have it for the past, uh, for 2000 to 2005, and we have a future scenario for 2060 to 2065, and even further to 2095. Um, so modeling is just in general a great tool. And from yesterday, you already started to learn all about ocean models. So the variability in the ocean um, is due to a variety of processes. So you can have a water parcel there um, with some specific characteristics, usually temperature, salinity, oxygen, chlorophyll. It's some of the variables we usually measure uh, from a water parcel. And it can change locally over time. Uh, due to solar heating, precipitation, phytoplankton blooms, grazing, or mixing. This is like a small scale uh, movement inside that water parcel, we usually call this turbulence. But that uh, water you're observing can also change because the parcel, um, that was phytoplankton bloom, the parcel of water moves around. So it can, there's currents all the time. They can be wind-driven, geostrophic in a larger scale, or density-driven. We have tidal currents. We have vertical water movements. We can call upwelling, upwards, or downwelling. That way. And all of this we consider advection. So your water parcel can change because things come and go through this water parcel uh, fixed in a space. So this uh, fixed in space is the Eulerian framework. Um, there are two methods to observe the ocean. The Eulerian framework is the most common one. So you are sitting in a spot and you observe a finite amount of water. So this little volume we are looking at. So it changed for two reasons, uh, local changes and also because the flow is coming through it. So it will bring other water masses with other properties. So in this framework, we have a coordinate reference um, system that is fixed usually or coordinate system. Um, and then our characteristics or variables, they change over time and also in a space, if you then move say a grid cell and you look at another little area of the ocean. 
In contrast, we have the Lagrangian reference framework in which you observe a tiny piece of fluid, but you move along with it. So you are not fixed in space nor in time. And it's a moving reference frame and your reference frames is the fluid particles themselves. So all of your variables, including locations, change over time. Um, so if you have a fluid element moving uh, on the Lagrangian reference framework, um, you will have a velocity on that set location and it will change over time. Then your variables will change um, according to this. So they will be um, changing based on both your position and time. If you are in the Lagrangian reference framework and you have a velocity exert over you, so you move over time. So even your location X, Y, and Z is depending on time. And mathematically, we have these two things, and this is the one and only equation I'm going to show you during this presentation. So if you are in the Eulerian reference framework, you have a, a fixed volume, um, fixed in space. So you have the local changes, uh, what the changes in time locally, and then you have your advection changes. Um, so this is due to everything that comes through um, your little box. And this is the Eulerian derivative um, or that change. Uh, um, they are just different reference framework to look at the same. So the Eulerian change is equal to the Lagrangian change. And this is what we call the material or total derivative. So if you move along uh, with a water parcel, uh, you will see a total change um, in time. But you have to consider that you are on a moving reference frame. So your location is also changing. So based on this, we have methods to observe the ocean. So Eulerian methods are everything that is fixed in the ocean. So we have moorings that have an anchor. And so they are just in one spot and then you are measuring with your sensor either. In this case, fluorescence is scattering uh, temperature and salinity. Any bottom mounted instruments are also an Eulerian reference frame. Um, so you have these, um, these frames that we put in the bottom of the ocean with different sensors. And you are again just measuring at a point and the currents are going by you. Even oceanographic cruises, well, you move on a ship, but you have this sort of grid that you want to sample. So you go to these spots and measure what's happening in, in those locations. Um, with these remotely operated vehicles, uh, similarly, they can be moving around, but you have gave them a route. So you want that specific region to be sampled. And even gliders, uh, we provide them a flying plan. So where they supposed to go and they drift from it. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, so basically in all of these um, examples, we are either completely fixed at a point or we drive somehow to a point and then we measure uh, what's there and what's happening there. In contrast, in the Lagrangian methods, um, you drift and that's what you want. So there is a much fewer observational methods uh, for the Lagrangian framework. We have the Argos float. So these are floats that profile in, in the water column and they go to a certain depth and then they drift in nine days. And uh, then after those nine days of drifting, so of course their position has changed and then they start to measure and they come up to the surface and they um, share the data through satellite. So this is the coverage of all Argos floats. Um, and you see it, there's like, huge cover as now this is a January 2020. Um, you can visit the website there. Um, and then we had also drifting buoys. So drifting buoys is just a buoy that floats on the surface. And then you have some sensors attached to it. And then you usually have a rope 
because you want this uh, whole system to move due to the water currents more than because of the wind that will be pushing on top of a floating wood. So you have this subsurface um, part or draw. And then they have an antenna and they can send uh, the information to the satellite system too. This is the Global Drifter Program from NOAA. And this is the coverage. And then you can also make your own, right? Uh, uh, this is me with some knock friends and Tanzanian friends where we we made these drifting buoys. So it's just a, uh, this wooden framework with a float. And we don't have the anchor here. We did have some sort of rope, which was just a, a cement bucket that you hang here. Uh, so it doesn't float so high and give it stability and make it so it's mainly driven by the ocean currents. And then we have uh, this electronics box. Um, it's just a GPS tracker. And we went into a little boat and we deployed them. Um, and these are the tracks that we got. Uh, we had four of them. We tossed them overboard at the shelf in Pemba Island uh, in East Africa. And then we tracked them for a couple of days and then we lost them into the Somali current. And this one, we didn't recover them. Um, so you can also make your own. Um, this was costing about $300 each, mainly the expensive bit is the electronic pack, which we just put, it's, this is over the shelf electronics and we just wire them and put them on a lunch box and waterproof it. So if you are interested in making your own, I can get you in touch with people that are passionate about doing this um, sort of little system. And this is the type of uh, observations that are directly comparable with particle tracking models. Of course, it's really complicated because in real life, you have a great amount of physical processes that are not represented in your models. So you always have to take this sort of statistical approach in which you release a bunch of particles and hope that one follow the track of your buoy, or you make this probable pathway uh, that will hopefully uh, represent the reality. Yeah, and my slide is not changing. Okay, then. So into modeling, we still have uh, the same thing, Eulerian methods, which are the most common ones. So all our ocean circulation models that have a grid, either a rectangular grid or a variable grid, either squares or triangular, they are both Eulerians. They have this fixed reference framework and they measure, um, you calculate the concentration of the stuff or you want this like velocity, temperature, salinity for each of the grid cells. Uh, the same idea applies to bio biochemical models. So these are models where they are trying to represent the marine ecosystem. MPCD are very classical ones. They stand for nutrients, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and detritus. So you basically have the food web and you have it as concentrations uh, on each of the grid cells. Even if you say phytoplankton and zooplankton, they move around, well, yeah, but in these models, you just have a concentration uh, of them on each of your boxes. Uh, so the Lagrangian counterpart is particle tracking models in which um, on that virtual ocean, you release particles and you track them. So you go along with the flow and you can sample along those trajectories, what was the temperature or the salinity that that particle was feeling. Uh, you don't sample the velocity because the velocity is pushing you around. You can back calculate the velocity uh, that make you go through that trajectory over time. Then in the real ocean, which reference frameworks uh, the marine organisms experience. So we have plankton, that is everything that gets carried away by currents, uh, phytoplankton, so plankton, but they don't have to be small, like the jellies are big, but they are still just floating around, so they're plankton. Uh, we have nekton, which is the stuff that has the ability to swim against ocean currents. So we have adult fish, whales, seals, sea turtles. And then we have dentals. So these are sessile or semi-sessile, so not motile organisms that are anchored to the bottom. Um, and then of course we have a lot of marine organisms that have this uh, 
bipartite life history. So they have two parts, the combination of, of plankton and either nekton or benthos, because like their early life stages, so eggs and larvae, they float around in the ocean, but when they grow, they settle or they learn to swim uh, and they become either nekton or benthos. So these creatures, um, plankton, it moves about, so it's clearly like Wangian, while benthos is stuck in a place, so it's clearly Eulerian. Then nekton, it's sort of a combination of both. So they move, but they move directionally. So they sort of know where they are going. However, if you, for example, uh, put a tracking sensor on a sea turtle or a seal or a shark, it will sample along a trajectory. And then you will get the variables along this trajectory. So I think it's more of a Lagrangian framework if you use them to measure the ocean. So Lagrangian particle tracking can be very useful and it basically helps us to answer the following questions. Where and where offshore stock is more likely to arrive? Where does the stock come from and where will it go? This is type of analysis we call source and sink analysis. Which places in the ocean and the coast are highly interconnected? So as I say, the ocean is highly dynamic. So it's useful to know these connections in order to manage and protect our ocean. And it can have many applications. Uh, so what else experienced the Lagrangian reference framework in the ocean? And um, here uh, I want you to think and maybe write in the chat if you have any answers. So basically everything that, that drips and everything that is discrete as opposed to continuous or dissolved. So single pieces, single particles as opposed to a concentration. And because you are not writing anything in the chat, I'm gonna go ahead and read your minds. So it can apply to floating plastic, sediment, oil droplets, egg and larvae of marine organisms, floating algae, driftwood, ghost net and even men overboard. So to wake you up and try to interact a bit, I'm going to run this little poll. Um, if you please go ahead and click your answers. So it's just two questions. Uh, do you think particle tracking will be useful to you? And then do you think you will use particle tracking in the future? So we have half of the people awake and answering that. Um, okay. Well, we have nine people missing, but I let it go because I think I have yet another one uh, that I'd like you to answer. So I'm going to stop it there. So everyone that answered thinks they will use particle tracking. That's great. Um, oh, I have to share the results for you too. There. And then, um, also, there's another one. Um, which type of particles are you interested on? And of course, as many mentioned, we have the chat list there. So you can comment. Um, specifically in this last column, do you have a particle tracking application in mind? Is there a place or a process that you think will be useful to model this way? Uh, let me see what this other poll is just what type of particles uh, will you be interested on tracking? So it's a multiple choice question. We have larvae, sargassum, plastic, sediment, oil, or others. So you can just click there. So we have an idea of your interest.
half of the people are awake and clicking. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the thing. So most of you, more than half of you are interested on sargassum. A um, couple of people in larvae and some others on sediment, one on plastic oil and one other. Great, thank you for participating. So then, uh, which physical process affects the Lagrangian transport? So we have, uh, first of all, currents. Uh, there are surface currents driven by wind and then deep currents driven by density. At larger scale, we have um, these currents that are affected by the Coriolis force. So we have these geostrophic currents and we know uh, they're everywhere in the ocean. Then we have wind. If you are floating in the ocean, um, you have a direct force exerting you by the wind. Um, so this is something we call wind drag or wind aid, and we can add that also to particles uh, to get the idea there. We have waves. Um, if you are in deep water, a wave doesn't transport mass. If you are floating in deep water and that is just deep, is just double the elevation of the wave. Um, so the particle, the wave doesn't fill the bottom. So you can just happily bob up and down into the deep ocean and you are not transported. Um, if you are a neutrally buoyant particle, you will follow this um, circular motion in a wave and you will ideally come back to the same position. So uh, there is no net mass transport, but since this orbital motion is not quite perfect and it doesn't close, it produces over time a net displacement that we call stock drift. These stock drifts will be the waves effect uh, pushing uh, particles around in the near surface. Then tides, you can think similarly to waves where the tide goes in an ebb current that takes you away from shore and within the flood current will bring you up uh, to the same spot. However, because non-linearity and friction with the bottom and a lot of uh, cross complicated processes there, this is not ideal. So there are, there are these residual currents uh, from the tide that are particularly common around complicated bathymetry, waves, and near shore. So we have a, a, a residual current. It's like that beat that you didn't come back to the same spot and did cost you um, to end up somewhere else. We have shear currents. So the wind is blowing in the surface, but it's this differential it has a differential push over the water column. So even because of the rotation of the earth, the current doesn't go parallel to the wind. It goes to the right on the northern hemisphere, and it does this spiral in depth, which we call the Ekman A spiral. Um, so you will be pushed in a different direction if you are near surface than if you are in deeper water. So what I mean with shear currents. And then we have a density, which also creates current, but also creates a stratification. So the water column is organized by density layers in the ocean. So you have less dense water, either warm or fresh near the surface. And then you have denser water, either saltier and or colder in the bottom. Um, and you have this peak nocline, um, which is this layer of strong change. And that's what we call the mixed layer. So basically the ocean moves like slabs. So you have your surface uh, and all the way to the mixed layer and that um, water layer will have, will tend to have a direction. And then the bottom water may have another direction or just move slower. Um, so this, 
gives some stability in the vertical direction to the ocean. And if this doesn't cause you motion, it will prevent you at least from moving in the vertical. Uh, so it also affects the Lagrangian transport. And then lastly, in my uh, little list, we have turbulence. Turbulence, as I say, is this small scale motion, which is enhanced near the surface uh, because of wind and waves. And it's also enhanced near the bottom because of friction with the bottom in what we call these boundary layers. And then in the middle, in the interior of the ocean, we have less mixing. Uh, so this, um, Tiny scale motions also influence um, Lagrangian transport, particularly causing diffusion. So if you toss like several orange in the same spot in the ocean, they will go different ways because there's, there's turbulence mixing them. And uh, it applies to, to small scale things. So more like sediment, uh, microplastics, larvae. So I just hand wave my way through all of these. So if you are not an oceanographer, you can learn more about all these processes uh, from the comfort of your kitchen. If you visit this website, Kitchen Oceanography, and there's lots of experiments there that you can do. If you are an oceanographer, you can also use it to entertain your household during this pandemic. Um, and also, and I didn't put it in the slides, the MOOC, uh, the National Oceanography Center has this online massive course and it's just restarting on Monday. So I will put a link to it in the chat somewhere because I forgot to put in the slide. And that's all. Um, that's all I have for this presentation. So if you have any questions, please let me know um, or put in the chat or on the Padlet. The Padlet will stay, stay there. So it's a way to having some sort of long-term communication with you on this topic.